as I often do, we've been kind of talking in more or less uh, military analogies and themes. Um, just to recap a little bit, all of this chaos, and it really is chaos, that we're seeing uh, in such an unusual way. When you look back through history, uh, up to our own time, it's amazing that today we can see what's going on pretty much in the whole world, every one of us, uh, in our own living room. Uh, it's an amazing thing, really. You, you, you sit at home and you see this succession of images through the media and you really can't escape very much. Um, the suffering in Iraq or Lebanon or Israel or Afghanistan or Africa, so many places. Uh, there it is in living color in your living room. All the blood and gore, murder and mayhem. It, it, it's like a perverse form of entertainment. It has very, it has something to do with the news sometimes, I suppose. But sometimes you wonder, you know, it's like entertainment. Uh, the cable news networks, for instance, you know, it, it, it's almost like um, they don't put what the most important news is, is all the time. They put what they think will increase their ratings or sell advertising space. Um, you know, the last couple of days, you know, um, that sad, unfortunate story of the, the, the John Benet Ramsey case, the little girl. <clears throat> you know, uh, sure, they, they all clamor. They, it's, a, it's like a feeding frenzy, you know? It, it's like if you go to the um, aquarium and you see the shark tank, you know, it's like you're throwing in a fish for the sharks. I mean, they all, they all converge on it and rip it to pieces. Um, it's a strange society that we live in. Um, and all of this chaos and the various forms that it may take, um, it can all be traced back to that interior battle, that spiritual combat that rages inside of individual human beings. And that's where it can always be traced back to. Like John Paul II said, all the divisions in the world can be traced back to one division. And that's the division inside individual human beings. And that division, we have a name for that. That's called sin. I'll never forget, a number of years ago, I would, I'll, I'm not positive what year it was, but I'm guessing that it was around 1996 or 7 when I was work, doing some work for the Bishop of Sacramento. Um, he and another archbishop somehow got me invited to one of a, in those days they called it a colloquies of bishops and scholars. And these were meetings that were held uh, in Episcopal regions. They would have the bishops of that Episcopal region and a like number of theologians uh, at a given location and they spend a day together. And they'd have mass and then prayer and then they would uh, have um, discussion. In the morning there'd be a presentation that someone would give a, um, a lecture for 45 minutes or an hour and then after the lecture, you had two, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And after the lecture you had 10 minutes to talk with the person on your left and your right, discuss the lecture, and then we would go around the room in turn and we each had five minutes to make an intervention. In other words, say something about the topic. <clears throat> well, I, th I was invited to one of these um, colloquies of bishops and scholars uh, for the West Coast. 
region. It was at a big hotel. Let's see. San Francisco. It was uh, in San Francisco, a big hotel out towards the airport. And uh, I, I drove in there from Sacramento the day before. And it, and it was in October because the World Series was just starting. And uh, I went early and I had, uh, I ate dinner alone. Nobody was there yet at the hotel. I ate dinner alone. Then I went up to my hotel room and it was a real nice, one of these atrium type hotels, you know, it has uh, the inside, you could, the elevator is glass and you can see all that. It looks like a jungle with, you know, <laughs> forest animals and <laughs> birds and so forth. Um, you know, nice place. And uh, I went up to, I wanted to catch the, I think it was the first or second game of the World Series. And so this was the big hotel where, where all the bishops and scholars were going to have their meeting. I went up and I turned on the television and, and instantly out came outright pornography. And, and I don't mean that uh, in a watered down sense that it was just bad stuff like you see on HBO or something. I mean this was the bad, really hardcore bad stuff. There it was, right on the television screen. And uh, I mean, it didn't have to look for a special channel. It just jumped right out at you. And, um, I was pretty shocked at that, and I mean, I've seen everything in my life, so, you know, I, I, but I was shocked that that should be there. And I called down to the front desk and raised you know what. <laughs> A guy came rushing up there, and he said, well, they had done something to the wiring in it, and you know, that's not normally like that, but they had managed to do this or that, and you know, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> Anyway, that's how the colloquy began. <laughs> and the next day, it kind of went downhill. <laughs> the topic was sin. No, I'm sorry. Shh, never use that word. <laughs> Moral theology in the light of Veritatis Splendor, that's one of John Paul's encyclicals, uh, means the splendor of truth. Um, moral theology in light of the encyclical Veritatis Splendor and the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now that's a good, that's a good topic. That, that I, that's pretty interesting. There was, I, I held uh, a great deal of hope in store for, for that one. Well, the guy gives the lecture in the morning and you know, then all the commentary, and I, and I sit there listening. Now, there's, I believe, 13 bishops were there, and a like number of theologians. And at one point, the presenter of the talk, who is a professor of theology at a seminary in Southern California that shall remain nameless. <laughs> there aren't a large number of them, so I suppose you could <laughs> guess that. Among other things, he said, we must never mention sin. Never mention sin. We don't talk about sin anymore. We don't, you know, sin is not something that's an antiquated term. You can speak of bad choices or emotional immaturity or this or that, but never speak of sin in the church. When it was my turn, guess what I talked about? <laughs> I remember once going, in my early years, I went to a uh, parish to do a parish mission during Lent, a Lenten mission. And the pastor of the parish picked me up at the airport. He was a very nice man, and they almost uh, usually are. And he, uh, he was kind of nervous. And uh, now this is way back, probably in the mid-90s. I wasn't really established yet. I wasn't known to large numbers of people. But it, still, my reputation had begun to precede me. <laughs> and he said nervously, Now, Father, 
I have good people. <laughs> that, that was my in, immediate reaction. <laughs> I have good people. Don't talk about sin. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, Father, it's Lent. <laughs> and they're human. What am I going to talk about if I don't talk about sin and grace, good and evil, truth and lies, life and death? That's what I talk about. That's what the church talks about. Uh, you know, until we develop this silly penchant for talking about nothing and calling it something. <laughs> now, there is sin. You don't believe me? Watch the 6 o'clock news. There is sin and plenty of it. But here we had a gathering of all of the bishops and theologians. And you know, I, I thought I'd fall out of my chair when he said that, and I figured everybody else would too. And I looked, not a raised eyebrow. Took it right in stride. And a number of other things too, a lot worse than that. We have had in the family, in the church, in the country, in the world, we have had a crisis of leadership. And this crisis runs deep. And it runs very broadly. Terrible crisis of leadership. I told you, I believe last evening, about 10 years ago I was speaking with a friend of mine who was a, a, a very fine Carmelite prioress, 60 years professed, and I had great respect uh, for the sisters and all our religious sisters, but uh, and it's, I knew them better than, than I know most, uh, contemplative nuns, and um, one of the great blessings of a, of a life of prayer, uh, interior life as we call it. One of the great blessings is clarity. Clarity, you know, they can think straight. They're able to see things in, in, in the pure light of Christ. And I said, Mother, you know, there were probably some headlines at the time. I, I don't remember what they would have been. But there was probably some kind of trauma going on in the world as there has been. Um, almost constantly in recent years. And I said, Mother, why do we have such weak, poor leadership so frequently? And she never batted an eye. She said, that's easy. Punishment for sin. Now, it hit me immediately that she was right. I didn't have to ask, I didn't have to ask questions about that. I just knew she was right. But you might want to ask questions about that. And you're, well, that's just her opinion. No, it's very biblical, as a matter of fact. Uh, her opinion was formed in the light of Christ. Uh, and and she, did, she, was, she didn't, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. She knew, and she knew definitively, clearly, absolutely. She knew it. Lousy leadership is punishment for sin, in plain English. In the Old Testament, the chosen people cried out in their desolation, Oh, Lord, we have no priest, prophet, or king to guide us. Why? Infidelity. They weren't faithful. They had drifted off to false gods. Remember when Moses came back, when he'd been up on the mountain and he came back? And the people, it didn't take them long. The people immediately said to Aaron, Moses' brother, well, make, make for us a god. We don't know where this guy Moses went. You know, he's gone. Make, a, make us a god that we can worship. Here, you know, and they gave him all their gold, all their earrings and all the gold. And, and Aaron, remember, he put all the gold in the furnace. And remember when Moses came back down off the mountain, he heard the sounds of, of merrymaking, 
Moses said, what's this? The sounds of partying? I've only been gone a couple of days. And he came in and he saw them singing and dancing and, and they have this molten, this golden calf. And Moses was not happy. And he let him have it. What's this? I've been gone a couple of days and you're worshiping false gods already? Idolatry? What's this? A golden calf? You remember what his brother Aaron said? It is the lamest excuse in the history of the world. Well, but, but Moses, uh, you know, you know uh, we, we, we just threw some gold in the furnace and this calf came out. <laughs> Leadership is a blessing. Leadership is a huge blessing. Good leadership. Bad leadership is a curse. Worse than your worst nightmare. Back in the 60s, a lot of Catholics, well, you, you remember the 60s now. I was in high school and college in the 60s. And the 60s was the I gotta be free, I gotta be me generation. Right? The 60s was, you know, Woodstock, um, shaking off the shackles of convention, uh, rebellion. And this carried all over into the church, too. I was, I remember preaching in Winnipeg, Canada, a few years back, and it just happened to be the 33rd anniversary of Humana Vitae, and also the 33rd anniversary of the Winnipeg Statement which I didn't remember what, what that was when I landed, uh, because um, for the first time in my life, I, I got treated as though I were a terrorist in Winnipeg. I think they thought I was a drug smuggler or something. And um, anyway, by the time I got to the conference, there was a bishop in the conference room, and uh, he was one of the original bishops, and I said, oh, I can't believe how much trouble I've had getting here. He said, well, you know where you are, don't you? I said, yeah, Winnipeg. He said, well, you know what that means, don't you? No. Nope. Uh, and then he reminded me, this is the 33rd anniversary of Humana Vitae, the 33rd anniversary of the Winnipeg Statement. That's where the vast majority of Canadian bishops signed a statement that came to be known as the Winnipeg Statement, which basically said Paul VI had erred in his encyclical. Humana Vitae, on the teaching on human life, about artificial contraception and abortion and so forth. A vast majority of the Canadian bishops signed this. In writing, they put their names. No, we repudiate. We reject the teaching of the Pope. And I was there for the 33rd anniversary. This bishop was one of five bishops who didn't sign that. And he'd been at the Vatican for some time, and he wrote a letter. This was just a couple years ago, on the 33rd anniversary, wrote a letter to the bishop. And he asked them, he said, brothers, on this great occasion, why don't we use this to make a statement to the faithful that we, we made a mistake 33 years ago. Made a mistake. Hey, to err is human. You know, we make mistakes, that can happen. So let's set it straight now. Let's just say, Hey, Paul VI was right. Matter of fact, he was prophetic in writing his encyclical on human life. They said no. They wouldn't do it. Good leadership is a blessing beyond calculation and bad leadership is a curse. We get very frequently we get what we deserve. People clamored back in the 60s. Uh, don't tell us what to do. Remember, got to be free, got to be, be me. Don't tell us what to do. Uh, keep the Pope out of our bedroom, they used to say. That, that was the battle cry. Watch what you ask for. 
Because what you might get is teachers who tickle your ears. What you might get is one of the worst curses you can imagine. A teacher who will confirm you in your sins. Can you imagine anything worse than that? Someone in teaching authority who would confirm you in your sins. Imagine a man up to his neck in quicksand. And through some kind of evil alchemy, you change the quicksand into concrete. Making it impossible for him to get out. A leader who will confirm you in sin is doing the devil's work, period, exclamation point. Leadership, what is it though? You know you can learn from all spheres of influence. Now throughout my life I've been involved in various things. Um, when I was younger, athletics, I was involved in the military for a while, I was even in law enforcement for a while, I was in the corporate world for a while. Now I'm in the church. So I have a certain amount of experience in a broad spectrum of human endeavors. And I think by now, at the age of 60, I've learned a few things uh, that, that could be useful. One of the things I've learned is across all these different disciplines or spheres of activity, there are certain principles that are exactly the same. The principles that you can use to prepare a football team to win the Super Bowl are very much the same as the principles you can use to have a fabulously successful corporation or military unit or just about anything. There's one thing I know for sure. No blood, sweat, and tears, no victory. No sacrifice, no victory. No leadership, no victory. But what is leadership? we have a tremendous amount of confusion today concerning uh, leadership in the world and in the church too. A leader is not merely a manager. Now get this. A leader is not merely an administrator. A leader is not merely a clerk. It is highly unlikely that any group of human beings will follow a clerk, manager, or administrator in a frontal assault on a heavily fortified position. It is equally unlikely that any group of human beings will follow a clerk, administrator, or manager in a frontal assault on the gates of hell. And I assure you that's what we're called to do today. And we need a lot more than managers and administrators. We need leaders. And nothing less than that will do unless you will settle for defeat. And if you'll settle for defeat, then let your leaders merely be managers or administrators or indeed clerks. Hard to get a military unit to follow a clerk in a frontal assault on a heavily fortified position. Basic premise, starting point, absolute assertion. The greatest leader who ever lived was Jesus Christ. There was never a leader more courageous, more effective 
than the Lord Jesus Christ. But what did he do, basically? He took ordinary people and they did extraordinary things. Jesus took ordinary people and the result was that they did all extraordinary things. He took a few, a few fishermen, little fishermen, not highly educated men, not men of high social standing, uh, no, no indication that they were more intelligent than everybody else around them. No, just simple people. He took ordinary human beings and then through his leadership, through his divine power, manifesting itself in that human leadership. Now, Jesus is a divine person. The subject of action is divine. He's the second person of the Trinity, the eternal word of the Heavenly Father. But he also has a human nature. He's true God and true man. And so the divine person, working through his human nature, effected a kind of leadership which caused ordinary men to do extraordinary things. That's a simple working definition of leadership. It's a lot more than management. Now management is not a bad thing. Management can be a component of leadership. But you can't reduce leadership to management. That's fatal. Fatal. I'm going to give you what I learned from the United States Army recently. I learned it a long time ago, but recently I had a friend of mine who's a master sergeant in the United States Army Special Forces. And by the way, I, I, I'm often asked, what's that pin you wear? Someone, they always think it's a sodality in the church, you know, because so, it's got Latin on it. And so it has a Latin, some Latin words on there, and people think that, you know, that's like some kind of priest pin. <laughs> or maybe like in the Holy Name society or something, which, which is a good thing. But no, it says here in Latin, de oppresso liber, to free the oppressed. That, that's the motto, and this is the insignia of the United States Army Special Forces, to free the oppressed. That's their motto. What did Jesus say? He said, I've come to set the captives free. You see, that's the business that we're really about. In a higher way, not that that's not a good thing, believe me, to liberate someone from physical slavery is a great thing, a noble thing. And so, you know, they, they, they do, do a good thing. But I'm talking about an even higher thing. Jesus said the man who sins becomes the slave of sin. And what did he come to do? Set the captives free. And so that's what we're involved in here. Leadership. I'm going to use, remember I said you can learn from every sphere of activity. You know, keep your mind open, keep your eyes open, uh, and you can learn and, and, and then elevate that uh, to the high ground of salvation. The Army uses an acronym. They take the word leadership, and this has been done in different ways. But one of the ways it's been done, and the way my friend, this master sergeant, did it for, for the folks in my office that work with me, I, I wanted him to come. So he came out and stayed at my home for a while, not too long ago, and he gave this little, little course on leadership. And um, it's very good. And the church needs this desperately. Leadership. You just take those letters, L, E, A, and so forth. L. Lead by example. Don't ask those in your charge to do something you wouldn't do. <laughs> I remember my Uncle Jimmy. I went to work for my Uncle Jimmy when I was 14 years old. Um, and now, I'm from the generation. Remember, my mom and dad were from what's been called the greatest generation. And um, they saw the Great Depression. My mom and dad both went through World War II. My my father in the Navy, my mother in the Army, and my mother outranked my father. <laughs> Both in the military 
and, and at home. <laughs> well, my mother was a nurse, and because she was a, a, a registered nurse, uh, she could go into the, um, into the Army Nurse Corps, and so she could get a commission that way as, as a registered nurse. And she worked at Bellevue Hospital in New York City, which was a lot of, uh, a lot of the wounded men came back from, from the war through Bellevue. And it was a, an enormous operation. And my mother was attached directly to a captain who was a surgeon. And so she was a surgical nurse. And she said she learned more in three years as a surgical nurse with this captain. Because you see, in the war, you, you get to see things you'd never see in ordinary um, work as a as a nurse or a doctor. So anyway, mom worked in the Army, dad worked in the Navy. They learned it. Many of us have learned it. If you're going to lead, you've got to lead by example. Lead by example. Now, we're all leaders at one time or another. Mom, dad, you're a leader. Pastors of parishes, you know, your leaders. You may be a leader in your profession, a leader in your workplace. At one time or another, in one way or another, we are all called to leadership. Now, lead by example. In working from my Uncle Jimmy, get back to that story, Uncle Jimmy was the head custodian of the school system in this little city where we lived. And mom, when I was 14, we, everybody had to work in those days, right? The kids were expecting, hey, 14, you're able-bodied, get a job. You know, you got to save up money for college, you know. And, and so mom said, oh, I'm going to go to Uncle Jimmy, and I'm going to get you a job. And I said, OK. So my mother went to Uncle Jimmy, oh, John, you know, he's 14. He could, uh, he could start working. and. Uncle Jimmy said, okay, but it won't be easy. In those days, nepotism <laughs> was not something that you wanted to be criticized for. So Uncle Jimmy hired me, and then he made me work harder than any dog <laughs> in history. Now, Uncle Jimmy was in charge of all the schools in town. I don't remember how many there were, but lots of them. And so in the summer, they had, you know, major cleaning projects in the school system. Uncle Jimmy gave me two jobs. Everybody knew I was his nephew. He gave me the most difficult job, the dirtiest job, and the most dangerous job. I cleaned every boiler in every school all summer long. And how that worked is, you know what a boiler is. They had, they had mostly oil-fired boilers. Yeah. And when the oil burns, it creates soot, right? And after a while, that gets on the sides of the boiler inside. You put coveralls on. You crawl inside the boiler with a putty knife, and you scrape off the soot off the sides and the ceiling, you know, of the boiler. Day after day, all hot summer long. And then every once in a while, Uncle Jim would come and say, Yo, Al, you got a break today. I'm going to let you clean the windows. <laughs> and I'd go up on the third story, the fourth, fifth story of this old brick buildings. And it's a little wooden chair that sits outside the window. And I gotta clean the windows hanging out. <laughs> One day, honestly, I was 15 years old, the chair collapsed, and I did a backflip off the third story window and luckily got my feet under me. I'd gotten killed. I'd broken my neck for sure. And um, I, I ripped my shoulder all to pieces. And um, Uncle Jim came along right after that, and he saw me in a heap. And once he determined I wasn't dead, <laughs> I'll never forget it. 
Uncle Jim was kind of sports oriented, you know, my whole family was. And he said, shake it off. <laughs> like, you know, no big deal. It's only three stories, could have been six. Take it off. Lead by example, Uncle Jimmy had cleaned every boiler, any window, he'd done it all. And when he said, hey, you know, you're a private here, you're just starting out, clean that. I never questioned him. Hey, Uncle Jimmy, he, he's, he, he invented all this stuff. Lead by example. You can't follow. Hey, you don't, hey, don't expect your kids not to smoke if you smoke. And if you drink to excess, don't wonder when your kids start drinking. When you give them bad example, don't wonder why your kids get in trouble. Oh, I know sometimes you can give a good example and they'll get in trouble, but that's not your fault. You do what you can do. Lead by example. Educate. That's the second letter of leadership, L-E, educate. Educate those you are responsible for. First of all, you've got to educate yourself. You can't give what you don't have. That's an old saying that priests used to learn in Latin. Nemo dat quod non habit. You just can't give what you do not have. So if you're going to, you know, the first line of catechesis in a family is the parents. Don't think the parish is the first line of catechesis. It is not. The parish can help and should. But you are responsible, parents, for the education of your children. How are you going to educate them if you don't have the education yourself? So, well, I, I didn't have the benefit of a lot of education. Okay. Get it. Get it. Just do it. You know, like the Nike commercial says, just do it. Now that refers to exercise. You know, but it holds true for everything. Just do it. You know, and one of the laws of physics, you know, about inertia and motion, you know, a, a, a body at rest tends to stay at rest. You know, a body in motion tends to stay in motion. At my home in northwest Montana, I have my office at home. My chapel's upstairs. My office is right outside my, my, my bedroom. So I got an office area. And there's a glass wall that, that looks through into us, kind of a sunroom. And in that glass room, I have some magnificent exercise equipment. <laughs> And I frequently look at it. <laughs> and I many times thought, wow, I bet if somebody used that stuff, you could really get in shape. Man, if you use that Schwinn Airdyne exercycle and those weights and that bench, You'd, you'd get pretty good physical condition. Just do it. But it ain't going to happen unless you do it. You got to start. Educate. You say, I don't have the education. Get it. I don't really know my faith. Well, you better learn it. You have the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Anybody who doesn't have a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, shame on you. Get it. You say, I don't like to read. <laughs> I'll bet you like to watch television. <laughs> you know? 8 o'clock Eastern Time every Sunday night, my series on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's been on for 10 years. No excuse. And you say, well, we don't get EWTN. <laughs> get it. <laughs> well, we don't have cable. Get a dish. You know, I mean, I, I have one. I got 150 channels. Ain't nothing on. But I got 150 channels, you know, I, I get, you know, I get EWTN and I'm on a couple other networks too. Learn your faith.
whatever it takes. Read the catechism, listen to an audio, tape a CD, a DVD. Uh, that's 48 hours of the teaching of the Catholic Church, and I stand behind it. It is the only thing of its kind in depth and scope in the entire world. Honestly, I've looked, hoping to find something else, and there isn't anything else. You know, I, I think there's a, uh, Cardinal Lorenzi did a short eight-hour series, and I believe uh, Scott Hahn and his wife did a short little series on never, but, but nobody took the whole catechism at the request of a bit of a bishop, condensed it into 48 hours of teaching and about 10 hours of question and answer. Now, this is the 10th anniversary this year of, the, of my series on the Catechism of the Catholic Church called The Teaching of Jesus Christ. We never brought the questions out. When we did the series, we had a question and answer session at the end of the day. And those, that, that, those tapes just sat in my closet for years. But this is the 10th anniversary this year, just about to come out. Pretty soon, that'll be out. Those question and answers, you can learn your faith very well. It's a good place to start. Start someplace. Read, listen, watch, whatever it takes. Educate, attitude. That's the third letter of the word leadership, attitude. Attitude sets the tone. Your personal attitude will affect other people. Your attitude can inspire people or scandalize people. Attitude. A leader has to have the right attitude. A leader has to be motivated. No one ever achieved greatness who wasn't motivated. You've got to be motivated. Look, I'm talking about the only thing ultimately that matters in life. Eternal salvation. You know, I know you have to make a living. I, I know it matters what, what house you live in or maybe, you know, you've got to have a car, especially in Southern California, you know. And, and you might have to have two. I don't know. It's okay. It's okay. You, that, those are basics. All right. But none of that's going to matter in the end. The only thing that's going to matter in the end is heaven. That's what love is about. A leader, ultimately, a real leader, the highest form of leadership, what we're talking about. A leader has to inspire those in his charge or her charge has to inspire them, educate them, motivate them, move them toward their ultimate goal in life, their ultimate objective. Heaven. Heaven. If I love you, and I do, I have to desire with all my heart and mind and strength that you get to heaven. If I love you, I want you in heaven. But that's not good enough that I just want you in heaven. I have to do anything and everything possible to get you there, and a lot of you don't want to go. <laughs> now, ain't that the truth? You know, Mom and Dad, you know that, right, Grandma? You know that. Some of your kids, they're acting like they don't want to go. You know? No, nobody says... Oh, yup, I'd like to go to hell. <laughs> you know, nobody says that. <laughs> you know, no, we don't say that. But our actions say that very frequently. There's people running around out here doing drugs, in gangs, violence. They, it's like taking a megaphone and saying, oh, I want to go to hell. <laughs> That's what it is. You know? You despise your neighbor, you know, you imagine somebody might have, you know, oh gosh, it drives me crazy. You know, 18 years ago, your cousin or your brother-in-law or your friend or this or that looked at you a little bit funny. <laughs> and you became highly insulted. And you haven't spoken to him since. 
Boy, don't you ever pray the Our Father again. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgiveness. But, you know, if I'm a leader, I've got to practice that. I've got to lead by example. I've got to educate. I've got to have that attitude. If I don't have that attitude, don't expect much. If you don't do that with your children or, or your subordinates, uh, whether it's in the parish, whether it's in a religious congregation, a family, whatever it is, if you don't do that, don't expect much in the way of results. See, that's leadership. God, do that. Lead by example. Educate. God, we've had lousy education in recent years, and not everywhere. There's been some good education some places. But in many places, and I'm talking about the church too, I'll give you an example. On the West Coast, there was a guy, and I never mention names because I do not ever intend to hurt a human being. I don't attack individuals, no matter how bad they are. I won't mention anybody's name. I've never done that. I just don't do that. But there was an individual who had a doctorate degree in religious education who taught all up and down the West Coast for a large number of years. Then he went over on the East Coast, and, and he actually ended up in my home parish. And there was an elderly school teacher who had uh, lit, gone through my catechism course, and uh, with the meticulous nature of a school teacher, taken notes, studied, learned. You know, because she was 80 didn't mean she couldn't learn. She learned. You better believe she learned. She had a good attitude. She was a leader. Well, she went through that thinking maybe she could learn some more, sat there at the end, she was flabbergasted, couldn't believe it. Now, this is the guy that had been a leader. He trained all the catechists and DREs up and down the West Coast for a number of years. This is the truth. At the end, they had a question and answer here, and this lady raised her hand and said, Dr. So-and-so, this man wasn't a priest, but he was a doctor of religion. He had a doctorate in religious education. Doctor, um... Do you believe uh, in angels? No. Now, that reminded me of another, another story when I first started about angels, and the guy was a big, fancy lecturer. He was a priest. He said angels are literary devices. There was another elderly lady sitting in the front row. This guy said, oh, yeah, them angels aren't really real. They're just literary devices. That's a thing used in Scripture to basically illustrate a point. It's a mechanism used to convey a point. And, and, and the lady, I, I was there waiting to speak next. I heard her. She's, she whispered in her friend's ear quite loudly. <laughs> she said, I wish one of them there literary devices would come down and kick his butt. <laughs> I, I like them old girl. And he went on, we don't really believe in the devil. Well, Finally, he said, and, and, and she said, do you believe in purgatory? No. you believe in hell? No. God, God, God is love. God is all merciful. God could never have a hell. You know, that sounds good, right? That's a, that's a plausible argument. And she said, Father, or, or, or a doctor, you don't, you don't believe in hell? He said, no. She said, well, you'll believe it when you get there. <laughs> attitude. Got to have the right attitude. Be motivated. Let me tell you why we've had a mess in the church and in the world. Nobody's motivated. Just kind of go with the flow. Dead bodies float downstream. <laughs> Don't go with the flow. Discipline. No discipline, no victory. Period. If you're an athlete, military commander, corporate CEO, 
pastor of a parish, religious superior, mom or a dad, whatever you are, whatever your leadership capacity, remember this. No discipline, no victory. You can't win without discipline. And at first, that means self-discipline to start with. You know, you've got to be a disciplined person. You know what it means to be a disciplined person? You know, there's a lot of things I don't like to do. I make myself do them. I don't like getting up at 3 a.m. Friday morning to go through the joy of airport security. <laughs> I don't like it. I do not like it, and I like it less every year. I give myself an order. Do it. Get up. Go. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's it, man. Discipline. And that starts with self-discipline. Now, if you are a ma mom or a dad, you have to have a certain amount of discipline in your house. Now, I'm sorry, but I come from the old days. I am old school. Now, I know you can't be overbearing. You don't want to crush their spirit. You know, you, you, you don't. There, there, there's a line here. But there's got to be discipline in the home. I was in a supermarket one day a few years ago, and some kid was having a, well, he was cursing out his mother, honest. This kid in, in the supermarket was using language with his mother, um, you know, I, it was none of my business. I wanted to grab him by his narrow neck <laughs> and choke him. If I had ever used language like that, my, in the first place, I didn't, wouldn't have had to wait for my father to kill me. My mother would have killed me. <laughs> That's totally unacceptable. And if you let it happen, shame on you. Oh, maybe the kid will divorce you. <laughs> you know, well, you know, he could call, call up Child Protective Services. My, my mother or my father is, is um, yeah, abusive, you know. Man, I, I guess it started with Dr. Spock, you know. He said, oh, we should never discipline our children. We, we, we should never hit our children. We could warp their little personality. <laughs> Man, I could hear my Italian grandmother now warp his little. Very often we deserve what we get. We've abdicated our authority in recent years, and our authority has been compromised, whether it's parents or anything else. Discipline. Empower your subordinates. You know, don't ride roughshod over them. Discipline is one thing, but empower them. Give them the tools to succeed. You wouldn't send a soldier into battle and, and not give him his, his equipment. You've got to give him his arms, you know, give him, give him his rifle or whatever, machine gun, give him his hand grenade. You can't send him on and say, win the war against a highly sophisticated, highly armed enemy, but I'm going to give you a toothpick <laughs> and a teaspoon. <laughs> now, the Marines might be able to adapt and improvise. They know how to do that kind of stuff, you know, and they could overcome that. But... Um, Empower your subordinates. Empower your children. Give them the tools to win. Receive and respect input and advice. I remember once telling a person in authority in the church that there was a bunch of homosexual activity going on in a seminary. And it's got to stop. And we were told not to be judgmental. S, sacrifice, selfless service, no pain, no gain, no cross, no crown, no gall, no glory, no Good Friday, no Easter Sunday, period. Exclamation point. That's the way it is. Leadership. That's the S in leadership. H, humility. Gosh, I, I, I can and have often given... One hour talks, I could give an entire university level course on humility. 
I'll, I'll synthesize it for you because I'm running out of time. No humility, no holiness. No holiness, no heaven. That's simple enough for you? That's what you call in-your-face truth. No humility, no holiness. You can't be holy without being humble. No humility, no holiness, no holiness, no heaven. That's, that, that's the sermon on humility. Now, I mentioned earlier how humility is the acknowledgement of truth, who God is, who I am. I'm little, he's big. He's everything, I'm nothing. But he loves the nothing. That's the truth. That's humility. You know, proceed in that fashion. You know, if I, I, I have a hard time looking at anything and accepting the judgmentalism of the world. Like even this poor lost soul who's all over the television screens now about, you know, th that poor little girl, John Bonet Ramsey, you know, the, the media's all in a feeding frenzy now on that. I don't know if he's innocent or, or, or guilty, and, you know, he's obviously a confused poor little man, but I, I can't even judge him. I don't know, you know. I don't know. You know, here, I'll give you a little tip on this. Look at something like that, as, as miserable it is, as it is. I remember when the scandals in the church came along, as horrible as that was. And, and, and you think you, you were upset about that? Uh, none of you was as upset as me. But you don't have to dress like this in public. <laughs> I do. I was very upset about that. But finally, I, I had to come to the realization, hey, except for the grace of God, there go I. And you've got to be able to say that. that that's humility. Except for the grace of God, there go I. I. I know for a fact, more than most people know maybe, but I know for a fact I could have been the worst murderer in history. I could have been violent, vicious. Only the grace of God. Only the grace of God prevented that. Except for the grace of God, there God. That You know where that expression came from? St. Philip Neri, walking through the streets of Rome, saw a man being led to the gallows, terrible murderer. And he pointed and he said, except for the grace of God, there go I. You have to be able to say that. You have to be able to say, except for the grace of God, I could be the lowest prostitute, the worst drug addict, the worst murderer except for the grace of God. Humility, the acknowledgement of the, of the truth. Initiative, seize the day. Don't sit around waiting for something to happen. Seize the day. Make it happen. Oh, my parish doesn't have a good program of religious education. Well, make one. Well, I'm not qualified to do that. I don't have a doctorate degree in theology. So what? <laughs> Learn your faith. Study the... You know, the Catechism of the Catholic Church is one book. And in that one book, you have, in essence, the entire teaching of the Catholic Church. So pick up the book, get the tapes, watch the show on television, learn your faith. Because you can't give what you don't have. And you can't be a leader without that. Learn your faith. I remember years ago, I determined, boy, I'm going to learn my faith up one side, down the other. I remember being in my home parish. I knew I had a vocation. I was getting ready for it. There was a, a sister there uh, in the parish, in pastoral associate or something. And this sister, for lack of a better term, was um, of a, what we might call, a liberal persuasion. Um, and, and sister knew that I, I was on a different page from her. And I was in a different planet from her. And, and she said, uh, I, like pitifully, she looked at me and she said, oh, you poor man, you, you'll, you'll never get it. Um, you, you just don't understand. Um, your understanding of the faith is myopic. Uh, your piety is medieval. Uh, you, are, you, you don't understand these things because you are uneducated. <laughs> and so I went off and promptly earned me five university degrees with highest honor. And I came back. I waited for the day. It took, 
11 years. And she was still back there in the parish. And I said, I'm back. I done got educated. He said, oh, your education is too conservative. And she d dismissed that. I got thrown out of a religious order because of a dispute over the Holy Eucharist. Because some of them there didn't believe that Jesus is truly present on the appearance of bread and wine. I got thrown out of that. They said, ah, he's just a big mouth novice. Now they watch me on television. <laughs> Initiative. And then he plan, prepare, persevere, and practice. In my own life, I can see that. You know, I came out of a pit. I was a low-life, miserable, drug addict, homeless in the streets of Los Angeles. And then, then God got hold of me. Our lady got hold of me and cleaned me up a little bit. And, and, and she said, now plan. Now prepare. Now persevere. Now practice. And I did. Year after year after year after year. And there were times when I got discouraged. And I didn't think I'd make it. And there were plenty who didn't want me to make it. But I planned. And I prepared. Oh, I went to a foreign country. Learned in a foreign language. Had to learn four foreign languages in my late 30s and 40s. My brain had slowed down by then. Harder to remember in language study, you know. It wasn't easy. I did it. By the grace of God. No merit of my own. Plan, prepare, persevere, and practice. L-E-A-D-E-R-S-H-I-P, leadership. Leadership. Those points are important. They're essential anywhere in the family, in the corporation, in the church, anywhere. Leadership. Be a leader. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I know I'm weak. I wake, every, I wake up every day knowing how weak I am. I wake up in the middle of the night sweating profusely, knowing how weak I am and how incompetent I am. But St. Paul says it is when I am weak that I am strong. And he says it is in weakness that God's mighty power is brought to perfection. So pray for strong leaders. Pray that we begin to have the kind of leadership in our families, in our government, and in our church. The kind of leaders that people will follow. Because we're in the fight of our life. We are now called upon at this juncture in history to mount a frontal assault on the very gates of hell. And then people are not going to follow a clerk or a manager, or an administrator. But they will follow a leader right to the very end. And in the final analysis, we can rejoice because we know the last chapter of the book. We win. God bless you.